Okay, and we are back. This is a check one, two, check one, two. Hello, everyone, and welcome. Welcome, welcome, welcome to everyone around the world. I'm here with my brother, Daniel Karzuski, a great man of God. You know, we're not going to waste any more of your time. We're going to enter into a moment of prayer. If there's anything in your hearts, any confusion, anything whatsoever, let's get right right now. Father God, in the name of Jesus, we come together in agreement by your holy blood. Thank you, Lord, for dying on the cross for our sins. Thank you for your death, burial, and resurrection. Thank you, Lord God, for your sacrifice. By your stripes, we are healed. We have a, we can have a relationship with the Father in heaven. Hallelujah, Lord. Thank you in Jesus' holy name. And in the name of Jesus, Lord God, please forgive us of all of our sins. If there are any areas of sin, any wickedness that's in our heart, we lay it at the cross. We ask of your forgiveness right now in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, thank you for forgiving us, Lord. And in the name of Jesus, Lord God, I pray we, uh, we welcome the Spirit of the Lord to come into this place, come into our presence. We thank you, Lord God, for joining us. Thank you. We honor, praise you, and worship you, Lord. And I, now I pray for Daniel, Lord, that you would bless him. Bless him. I pray that you would think through his mind and speak through his vocal cords, Lord God. We stand on your holy word in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. Well, brother, you got the show. Go ahead. All right. Well, thanks again, Brother Arsenio. And good afternoon again, everyone. All right. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Today, we're going to go starting back again on our second series here in the health, wealth, and fitness from a biblical perspective. This is what we're going to be looking at today, but more specifically, last week we went over an overview, and this week we're going to be going in-depth on health and the different types of food that God has commanded us to eat or not to eat, and we're going to look at a lot of different verses. Uh, health is mentioned over uh, 64 times in the Word of God, and then you know if you add in food and, and other different topics and words, you're going to find it several hundred times mentioned throughout the Word of God, but we're only going to look uh, at a few verses this afternoon. Well, several, not a few, but uh, without further ado, let's get right into it. And we're going to talk first about Proverbs 16, 24, and it says, pleasant words are as in honeycomb, sweet to the soul and health to the bones. And here we see that food is being utilized to explain the Word of God, that whenever you have uh, somebody speaking a good word, it tastes like a honeycomb. It feels good. Uh, and so that's what we as Christians should do. It's sweet to our soul and it nourishes the, the bones even. It says it's health to the bones. And again, those are those miraculous things that we don't know exactly how God intertwines and works those out. But I know when uh, somebody gives me a compliment, I know I feel a whole lot better than if somebody uh, says a mean word to me or whatever the case may be. First Corinthians 10 31 says, whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. This is one of my life verses, and I've known this verse for several years now, and I live by this. And what I like to think about this verse is that God will not bless you if you are not first putting him and his glory in your eating and then your drinking and then pass that. Think about it. He puts the basics, the basic necessities of life. He wants you to do them to the glory of God in the basic necessities before whatsoever you do. We know that there's going to, God's going to give us tasks and whatnot, but if we don't honor him in our eating and our drinking, uh, then are we doing things to glory God? And are we mistaking something that he's given us? Or are we not managing our food and our drink properly? And then is everything else that we do, is it going to be blessed by God, if we're not doing things for the glory of God. So th that's to be seen in your own life. And again, at the at the judgment seat of Christ, when we're all rewarded for our good deeds and our bad deeds, and we'll see what God does with all that. But until then, whether therefore you eat or drink, whatsoever you do, do it all to the glory of God. Then in Proverbs 25, 27, it says, it is not good to eat much honey, so for men to search their own glory is not glory either. And so we see here that it's not good to eat much honey, and honey is sweet, so we shouldn't eat a lot of sweets is basically what it's saying. And then the contrast and the comparison here is that 
We're not supposed to be out there patting ourselves on the back and looking for our own glory. We're supposed to be looking again, just like the verse before that said, for the glory of God. And then so moving on, we see in Genesis 1 29, and God said, behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed, which is upon the face of all the earth and every tree in the which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed to you. It shall be meat or food in the Hebrew at the time. And so we see that God has given us every herb bearing seed and fruit tree yielding seed. And those are the things that that we can eat uh, that are healthy for us, that we know uh, basically in the last 6,000 years, people have understood and figured out which things are, are poisonous and which things are not and which things are good for your nutrition and good for your health. And so here we are. God says that he has given us all the herb bearing seeds and the fruit of the tree yielding seeds, and they're good for us to eat. Then we're going to look um, pretty pretty heavily and pretty deeply here in Leviticus 7 and 11. Uh, Leviticus 7 chapter, Leviticus chapter 7 verses 23 through 26 says, speak unto the children of Israel saying, ye shall eat no manner of fat of ox or of sheep or of goat and the fat of the beast that dieth itself and the fat of that which is torn with beasts may be used in any other use, but ye shall have in no wise eat of it. For whosoever eateth the fat of the beast of which men offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord, even the soul that eateth it shall be cut off from his people. Moreover, ye shall eat no manner of blood, whether it be of fowl or of beast in any of your dwellings. So here what we see in Leviticus 7, 23 through 26 is that God is telling us not to eat fat and not to eat blood. And this was really spoken to the children of Israel, though. And we'll see kind of how this contrasts with uh, the way that Paul and, and Christ have kind of delineated this in the New Testament for us. And we'll get a better understanding of how we as Christians uh, can and should eat. However, these are good guidelines. These were the old Levitical Jewish Old Testament laws for the the Jewish people at the time and they were very strict obviously I mean even it says you know they'll be cut off if they if they eat these things so and one would wonder you know were they the healthiest people because they ate this way I don't know but I know a lot of our health problems in today's day and age come from uh, people eating too much fat and too much raw meat and right here it is clear clear plain as day God says don't eat the fat don't eat the blood and then in Leviticus chapter 11, verses 1, And the Lord spake unto Moses and to Aaron, saying unto them, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, These are the beasts which ye shall eat among all the beasts that are on the earth. Whatsoever parteth the hoof, and is cloven-footed, and cheweth the cud among the beasts that ye shall eat. Nevertheless, these shall ye not eat of them that chew the cud, or of them that divide the hoof, as like the camel because he cheweth the cud, but divideth not the hoof, he is unclean unto you, and the cunny for the same reason, and the hare for the same reason, and the swine for the same reason as well. And so we see that these are the types of animals that God has said they're clean, and these ones are not. And we see that also in history, uh, people get sicknesses when they eat these types of unclean animals. Um, and of course, you could get sick, you know, if you ate uh, you know, contaminated meat from one of the other beasts as well, whatever the case may be. And the concept here is being clean. Um, and God also, this is a correlation unto us being holy before the Lord as well. And it doesn't really have to do too much with our eating in, in today's day and age, although there, there is some aspect of responsibility that we have as human beings and as Christians to be stewards of the food that we eat and not to waste it, not to overeat. You know, if God's given us it, hey, let, let us bless it and ask the Lord to keep us healthy. Um, but we see here that these are the ones that God has told us that we can't eat and that we can't eat. But again, the children of Israel, and this is part of their Old Testament Levitical law. But today, and for Christians and, and for us, these are great guidelines to go by. And this is what we should do. Although we know that our food is heavily contaminated with all different types of drugs and antibiotics. And so it's real uh, you know, difficult to figure out how exactly should we be eating in today's day and age. You might have somebody who smoked until they were 100 years old and they lived. And then somebody that, uh, you know, ate, ate and an contaminated animal one time 
you know, off of even the clean list or whatever the case may be, and then they died. So we don't know how all these things work together and uh, different types of situations, different bodies, different people's bodies are different, genetics, whatever the case may be. But again, we're, we're seeing what the Bible has to say about health and uh, fitness and, and, and wealth here and food through the biblical perspective. And then in Numbers chapter 11, verses 5, it says, we remember the fish which we did eat in Egypt freely, the cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, and the garlic. Although we know they were just having an epiphany at that time, they were uh, seeing a mirage. They were not eating those things when they were in Egypt, uh, and they were surely not free. That's for sure, even though Numbers chapter 11, verses 5 is what the Israelites said. Uh, we know that they were lying to themselves because they, they were not eating those things. They were slaves, and they were not eating melons, leeks, onions, garlics, cucumbers, and fish. They were probably eating uh, the same thing that the swine were eating because they were they were less fortunate people and uh, they were slaves to do a job and that was it and they were mistreated uh, and I'm sure they were misfed and or fed at all they might not have been fed at all but in any case um, these are some foods that are good for us and spinach and garlic are two of the most healthiest foods that that you could eat on the planet and fish is definitely much more healthier than chicken and, and beef. And the way that I like to put it is that anything with the least amount of legs is more healthy for you. And of course, fish has zero legs and chickens have two and they're a little bit more healthy uh, or a little bit less healthy than fish. And then cows and other four footed beasts and animals have four legs. So they're a little bit less healthy and they obviously have more fat, more blood, whatever the case may be and, and less nutrients overall than uh, fish and, and chicken. So then moving on, we see in Daniel chapter one, verses eight, and then we'll go down to 12 through 17. It says, but Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore, he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. And this is also one of my favorite verses in the Bible. And it's a good reminder. Anytime you're about to do something, anytime you're about to go into sin, just quote that verse to yourself, purpose in your heart that you won't defile yourself. It doesn't even matter what the kings meet or not, but purpose in your heart that you won't defile yourself before God and before man. And that word defile, that is a deception. That he's, the king's meat is deception. It's deceptive meat. It's, it's meat offered to idols. So, and he didn't want to defile himself. He didn't want to make himself unclean, unholy. And that was the Levitical law that we just read about. And then in Daniel 1 through uh, 12 through 17, it says, prove thy servants. I beseech thee 10 days and let them give us pulse to eat, which is like different types of vegetables that grow in the ground and water to drink. Then let our countenances be looked upon before thee and the countenance of the children that eat of the portion of the king's meat. And as thou seest, deal with thy servants. So he consented to this mat to them in this matter and proved them 10 days. And at the end of 10 days, their countenances appeared fairer and fatter in flesh than all the children which did eat the portion of the king's meat. Thus Melzar took away the portion of their meat and the wine that they should drink and gave them pulse. As for these children, God gave them knowledge and skill in all learning and wisdom. And Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. And so it's clear, plain as day, again, that if we eat a healthy meal and not uh, the foods that God said not to eat, and we don't eat foods that we know are not good for us, then God is going to bless us in that. And he will not only give us fairer and, and better looking skin and flesh and, and a healthier life, he may even give us greater knowledge and greater skill in learning and in wisdom and in understanding. And that's, of course, one of our prayers is that God would give us knowledge, wisdom, and understanding as Solomon prayed for. And then moving on in Exodus chapter 23, verse 19, it says, the first of the first fruits of thy land thou shalt bring into the house of thy Lord thy God. Thou shalt not see the kid in his mother's milk. And so God wants the first fruits. Jesus Christ is the first fruits, and then we are the first fruits of that first fruit. And you see that in the New Testament. But all the first fruits were supposed to be brought to God first. And there, there you are with fruit, 
So they were supposed to bring fruit as an as an offering, or as a tithe and an offering. They were supposed to bring that unto the Lord. And then, of course, we know fruit tastes wonderful and fruit is good for us. So we should be eating fruit. God puts big emphasis on fruit and vegetables in his word. And in Proverbs chapter 23, verses 2, it says, And put a knife to thy throat, if thou be a man given to appetite. Uh, I, I speak this in love and in kindness and in all mercy and, and grace and diligence for anybody out there struggling with eating and dietary habits. Put this verse in your mind. And it's not saying to commit suicide. It's saying that basically when you are given to a great appetite and you continue to eat and eat and eat and eat until you gorge yourself to no other then it's like you have basically done the first portion of that verse and that's putting that knife to thy throat uh and so we don't want to um do that especially uh to be a, a non-witness to the lord like how first uh, corinthians 10 31 says where we're supposed to do everything to the glory of God, whether we eat or whether we drink. And so then Proverbs chapter 13, verses four says, the soul of the sluggard desireth, but hath nothing, but the soul of the diligent shall be made fat or prosper. And in contrast, Proverbs 20, verse four says, the sluggard will not plow by reason of the cold. Therefore shall he beg in the harvest and have nothing. So you've got a lazy person that is not willing to work or do anything because it's cold outside, but then he's wondering where his food is in the harvest and he will have nothing, God says. And so that's very sad. So this is a warning of God in Proverbs, not to be lazy, not to be a sluggard. And in Psalms 107 verse nine, it says, for he satisfieth the longing soul and filleth the hungry soul with goodness. You know, when I queried that, that word hungry in the Bible, this is one of the verses that I found. And it's so unique that he will fill a hungry soul with goodness and with mercy and with long suffering. And he'll satisfy you if you just give your life over to Christ, give your life over to the Lord and let him rule your heart's desires. Uh, ask the Lord to control your tongue, to control your appetite, uh, to control your mouth, whatever the case may be. Always ask the Lord for help in any area. And in Proverbs 25, 21, it says, if thine enemy be hungry, give him bread to eat. And if he be thirsty, give him water to drink. And so we see even here, there's there's two principles. It's, of course, uh, love your enemy as yourself or as or love your neighbor as yourself. And here we see the enemy. It's just like the Gene Geneva Convention here, here with us in the military. We see that we're supposed to take care of our enemy if they're if they're wounded in battle, whatever the case may be. But also we're supposed to give them bread to eat and give them water. So bread and water, a lot of people will say that's a prison diet or whatever the case may be. But I'll tell you, I eat bread and water every single day. It's part of it's a, it's a staple in my diet. And I don't think we could live without it, uh, except for where God says that man shall not live by bread alone. And again, we touched on that uh, last week. And in Proverbs 27, 7, it says the full soul loatheth and honeycomb, but to the hungry soul, every bitter thing is sweet. And that's, of course, somebody who's eaten too much, they don't want anymore. And somebody who hasn't eaten anything, even a bitter thing uh, tastes wonderful. And so just be careful uh, with that, because we don't want to get we don't want to overstuff ourselves and we don't want to uh, become anorexic either. Uh, of course, that, that's not really a thing that's talked about too much these days. I don't see it really happening all that much, but I know there's still a lot of people out there that starve themselves for different various reasons, uh, health or look or whatever. But um, we can have a well-balanced diet and, and live safely and securely in uh, the love of Christ. And in Philippians 412, it says, I know both how to be abased and I know how to abound everywhere and in all things. I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. This is Paul speaking from a prison and he's writing this. Of course, he was probably, you know, not being fed anything. And there was times when his stomach was full and his stomach was hungry, but he learned how to be content in those things. He learned how to abound and to suffer need, no matter what the case, no matter what the circumstance. And that's a great example for us Christians uh, from 
I think one of the greatest Christians that ever lived. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 2, and then down through uh, 1 Corinthians 8 through 13, we're going to see what uh, God says in the New Testament about milk. And it says, I have fed you with milk. Uh, sorry, not, not just milk, but also uh, about food in the New Testament. It says, I have fed you with milk and not with meat. For hitherto ye were not able to bear it, neither yet now are ye able. And there's an analogy there uh, with food. Just like a brand new baby has to drink milk from his mother, we as new Christians have to slowly consume the word of God. We can't understand hard things right off the bat. And so we need to be fed, not slowly, but we just need to, it's constant drip we need to have. And then once you get a little bit older in Christ, you start uh, studying more and more and more, and you get into the deep things of God, and that and those, that's the meat right there. But then further on, it says, as concerning, therefore, the eating of those things that are offered in sacrifice unto idols, we know that an idol is nothing in the world, and that there is none other God but, but one. For thou there be, for though there be that are called gods, whether in heaven or in earth, as there be gods many and lords many, but to us there is but one God, the Father of whom are all things, and we in him and one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we by him. Howbeit there is not in every man that knowledge, for some with conscience of the idol unto this hour eat it as a thing offered unto an idol, and their conscience being weak is defiled. But meat commendeth us not to God, for neither if we eat or we are or we the better, neither if we eat not are we worse. Take, but take heed, lest by any means this liberty of yours becomes a stumbling block to them that are weak. For if any man see that thee which hast knowledge sit at me in the idol's temple, shall not the conscience of him which is weak be emboldened to eat those things which are offered to idols? And through thy knowledge shall the weak brother perish for whom Christ died. But when ye sin so against the brethren and wound their weak conscience, ye sin against Christ. Wherefore, if meat make my brother to offend, I will eat no flesh while the world standeth, lest I make my brother to offend. And here we see that Paul is, is giving us great liberty to utilize in the New Testament the ability to eat anything that we want, even meat offered to idols, so that we wouldn't offend somebody. And we don't want to definitely don't want to offend them, and we don't want to offend Christ either. So if some, somebody invited me over when I was in Africa to eat some, um, I think it was like an ox head or something uh, awkward that I had never seen or, or heard before. Um, and we had to eat it and we did it because they made it and they labored and they strived and that's what they did. And we didn't want to be a stumbling block and cause an offense for that person. So uh, God gives us great liberty here to be able to choose now. And we'll see some more verses about uh, what God has said in the New Testament about food here in a little bit. But in Hebrews chapter 5, verse 12, it says, For when for the time ye ought to be teachers, ye have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. So we need to not continue uh, in going back to, to milk all the time we we don't we sh once we get some basic principles of god down we don't need to continue going back into the basics uh we should continue to strive for the masteries as god says and then it says in hebrews 5 13 for everyone that uses milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness for he is a babe and i think we all want to grow in christ and so we ought to use great wisdom here and put this to use and put it to practical application and Wean off of the milk and get deep in the word of God and utilize the meat that's being offered to us. Genesis 43, 11 says, and their father Israel said unto them, if it must be so now do this, take of the best fruits of the land in your vessels, carry them down the man, a present, a little balm and a little honey, spices, myrrh, nuts, and almonds. And I put this verse in here because it talks about taking the best fruits of the land. And then it talks about these other different types of food products that we can get that God has told us that are good for us and that we should be eating. And so I encourage people to really think about this and put these types of foods into their, into their diet staple. Song of Solomon 6, 11 says, I went down into the garden of nuts to see the fruits of the valley and to see whether the vine flourished. 
and the pomegranates budded. And if you've never had a pomegranate, I highly encourage you to eat one. They're amazing, wonderful fruit. And we see that there's a garden of nuts and the fruits of the valley. So again, another emphasis on fruits and nuts and how they're healthy for us. And you can find all different kinds of health benefits from those fruits and nuts uh, in your in your local store, wherever, right? But we see it here in the word of God too. And God admonishes us and tells us that these things are good for us. Proverbs 38 and 9 says, Remove far from me vanity and lies. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with food convenient for me, lest I be full and deny thee and say, who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor and steal and take the name of God in vain. Another great principle here that Solomon points out to us that we should, you know, ask the Lord to feed us. And think about if we feed ourselves, if, if we think that we come to a point in our life where we've made it and we're the ones that are doing all the feeding. I mean, all it takes is one famine, one one big drought, one uh, crop to be destroyed. And if let's say we didn't have the great you know glories of all the food that we have in today's day and age, we'd be out there in the field picking it ourselves too. And if, if God dried up the rain, we wouldn't be eating. It'd be very difficult. We'd be starving. So we need to always remember that our food comes from the Lord and ask the Lord to feed you with food that's convenient for you, that's healthy for you, that's going to uh, give you a great long lasting life. Psalms 136, 25 says, who give the food to all flesh for his mercy endureth forever. Again, another principle that, that shows God gives us food for ourselves, for our flesh. Psalm 78, 25 says, man did eat angels food and he sent them meat to the full. And that's a reference in Psalms all the way back to when the Israelites were in the wilderness and they were eating manna from heaven and manna is what is it they didn't even know what it was but they when they explained it they said it was like a like a honey wafer almost and so we kind of think of like a we'd kind of think of it as like a donut or something like that but in any case uh they called it angel's food and in Job 23:12 it says neither have I gone back from the commandment of his lips I have esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food and this is a great verse because the, Job was uh, one of the first, I, I believe it was, it might have even been written before Genesis, technically, in terms of uh, timeline, even though the timeline of Genesis started. What I'm saying is Job might have been born before Moses and could have written this before that. That's what most scholars believe. And so we see here, even before David wrote, and, and Paul wrote about the word of God being a food and a nourishment unto their lives. We see that Job esteemed the words of God more than his food. And then that's a huge statement. But furthermore, 2 Samuel 9, 10 uh, says that thou therefore and thy sons, thy servants shall tilt the land for him and thou shalt bring in the fruits that thy master's son may have food to eat. So again, another emphasis on fruits. De uh, Deuteronomy chapter 10 verse 18 he doth execute the judgment of the fatherless and widow and loveth the stranger in giving him food and raiment and we see that that principle in the old and the new testament where God's going to take care of the father the widow uh, and and the stranger and he give us us all food and raiment God said that he was even going to clothe and feed the sparrow and how much more does he love you how much more is he going to feed his own creation his own we were made after the likeness and the image of God. So why would he not take care of us, especially so long as, uh, you know, we we continue to strive to, to love him. But here, these are people that were fatherless and, and widowed and, and strangers, but God still even fed them. So how much more shall he, he feed you, especially if you love him and you serve him? Leviticus 19, 23 says, and when ye shall come into the land and shall have planted all manner of trees for food. Again, uh, this was time where we're seeing a lot of fruits and trees being planted and this is how they were going to get their food mainly uh if you think about in terms of the amount of meat that we consume in today's day and age um the number one most food deficient um resource that people are lacking in today's day and age is not protein we are over proteinated uh, people in the world and we're an under we, we're an under fibrinated basically we have a lack of fiber so things get stuck and things get messed up and our, our body doesn't work the way it, it should because we have too much protein 
and we have just too much stuff being put into our bodies uh, that are not natural and we need to it's, it's high time to get some of that stuff out of our our system in Genesis 44 1 it says and he commanded the steward of this of his house saying fill the men's sacks with food and again here another principle just talking about how we need to fill our sacks with food and that was you know written unto uh the time of Joseph and but again a principle for the sacks of food Genesis 2 9 says and out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food the tree of life also in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and in Genesis 3 6 and when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eye and a tree to be desired to make one wise she took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also unto her husband with her and he did eat and again Terrible scenario here where they disobeyed God and they ate of the knowledge of, uh, out of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, um, in which they, they should not have done that. But in any case, it was fruit, but it was a bad fruit. And there can be rotten fruit and there can be good, ripe fruit that's good to eat. And this is just another principle showcasing to us what we should be putting on our bodies and what we should not. Psalm 6, verses 2, have mercy upon me, O Lord, for I am weak. Oh, Lord, heal me for my bones are vexed. This is a verse about healing. When you, I, I've prayed this verse many times. Anytime I've been sick, I ask the Lord, oh, Lord, heal me. Uh, I'm sick. I'm weak. I'm not feeling good. Have mercy on me for my bones are vexed, David said. Psalms 41, 4 says, I said, the Lord, be merciful unto me. Heal my soul for I have sinned against thee. If you've sinned against God, just pray this prayer. Pray this verse right here. Lord, be merciful unto me. Heal my soul. Heal my very soul, for I have sinned against thee. Isaiah 57, 18 says, I have seen his ways and will heal him. I will lead him also and restore comforts unto him and to his mourners. I create the fruit of the lips. Peace, peace to him that is far off and to him that is near, saith the Lord, and I will heal him. Jeremiah 3, 22 says, return ye a backsliding children, and I will heal your backsliding. Behold, we come unto thee, for thou art the Lord our God. I, I'm talking to many backsliding people out there. I was backsliding at a time in my life, and the Lord spoke to me with this verse, and, and he definitely healed my backsliding. He removed it all, and he can do that for you too. The Lord is just an about face away. You just turn right around, no matter how many steps you've gone away from him. He will be right there waiting for you, just like the father and the prodigal son. Jeremiah 17, verse 14 says, Heal me, O Lord, I shall be healed. Save me, and I shall be saved, for thou art my praise. Jeremiah 30, 17 says, For I will restore health unto thee, and I will heal thee of thy wounds, saith the Lord. Because they called thee an outcast, saying, This is Zion, whom no man seeketh after. But again, a verse about healing. Matthew chapter 10, verse 18 says, heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils, freely ye have received, freely give. This was the ministry of Christ. This is what Christ was doing. He came here on this earth to do the healing, the cleansing, and the raising of the dead, and the casting out of devils. And God, can, God is still in the business of healing the sick and, and doing all of these things. And we've seen it surely in our generation and we'll continue to see it until the Lord comes back. And that's just a unique ministry that the Lord has through the Holy ghost is that he gets to still continue to heal people. And I love seeing people healed. Matthew chapter 13, verse 15 says for this people heart for this people's heart is waxed gross and their ears are dull of hearing and their eyes. They have closed lest at any time they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and should understand with their heart and should be converted, and I should heal them, or then I will heal them, and think about it, it's just, again, the concept of repentance, the concept of opening your eyes, opening your ears, opening your heart to the Lord, and allowing the Lord to convert you in your soul, in your mind, in your body, in your spirit, and then you get healing, it's no doubt, that's, that's my testimony in my life, where at a time, I didn't, I wasn't listening to the Lord, I didn't want to do the things of God, and when I opened my eyes and my ears and my heart and my spirit, I allowed the Lord to enter into my, into my being. Then I was converted. Then I was healed. Then things started going right in my life. And countless, countless thousands, if not millions of other people have the same exact testimony. 
We're almost done here. In 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 13, it says, And Elijah said unto her, Fear not, go and do as thou hast said, but make me thereof a little cake first and bring it unto me. And after make for thee and for thy son. And if you know the story, there was the last piece that she had, but she had to do as the prophet said. And it was good that he said, fear not before. So that way she had a little bit of confidence in her and she obeyed God. She obeyed the prophet and she went and did according to the saying of Elijah. And she and he and her house did eat many days, not just one day, many days. And the barrel of meal wasted not, neither did the cruise oil fail according to the word of the Lord, which he spake by Elijah. And this is, of course, a miracle, but it's it's a, it's a cake. It's a piece of bread. It's a barrel of meal that they utilized to mix with oil and, and they made it and they continued to eat bread uh, and cake here for a while. And that's just a miracle and a blessing of God. And again, another example to us in food. And in Ezekiel 4, 9, it says, take thou also. And if you know this verse, Ezekiel 4, 9. This is the Ezekiel 4, 9 bread that you're going to find in most grocery stores. Might be a little bit more on the pricey side, but what's not pricey these days? Um, you'll you'll definitely enjoy this all natural bread. It's not it's not made with any preservatives, any fake any fake chemicals, nothing. It, it's purely just from the ground, just the way that God intended it to be eaten and made. And it says, "Take thou also unto thee wheat, barley, beans, lentils, millet." fitches and put them in one vessel and make thee bread thereof according to the number of the days that thou shalt lie upon thy side 390 days shalt thou eat thereof and that's another prophecy for another time that we'll talk about but the concept here again is these are foods that are known as um, all part of the bible diet the kosher diet this is when you go to israel when i was there these are the types of foods that they eat all the time and it's good to see that that stuff is being sold here in the united states and i'll tell you you, you eat a, a bowl of lentil soup a bowl of beans uh some wheat foods some some millet you will be full uh to to your to your stomachs um uh, to your stomach and your heart's uh, content and desire and you, you won't want to eat anything else after that it, it'll it'll be good and finally, with the last verse, it says here in 1 Corinthians 10, 25 through 33, whatsoever is sold in the shambles that eat, asking no question for conscience sake, for the earth, for the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Any of them that believe not bid you to a feast and you be disposed to go, whatsoever is set before you, eat, asking no question for conscience sake. But if any man say unto you, this is offered in sacrifice unto idols, eat not for his sake that showed it. And for the conscience sake, for the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Conscience, I say not thine own, but of the other. For why is my liberty judged of another man's conscience then? For if by grace be a partaker, why am I evil spoken of for that which I give thanks? Whether therefore ye, again, ye eat, drink, or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. Give none offense neither to the Jew, nor to the Gentile, nor to the church of God, even as I please all men in all things, not seeking my own profit, but the profit of many that they may be saved. And so you got to do whatever your conscience is telling you ultimately at the end of the day. But God and through Paul in the New Testament has given you great liberty. Uh, number one, to do what you need to do concerning the food that you're going to eat. Uh, and then again, also not to be judged. Um, but we shouldn't judge other, others. And where we are judged, we're going to be judged even, even more harshly. But we need to judge righteously. And, you know, again, if somebody if I'm going over to somebody's house and they're making something, sure, I'll eat it. But if there's other options, you know, eat something different, whatever the case may be. But this pretty much concludes the end of uh, my my topic on health and food in the health, wealth and fitness series. And what we've been talking about uh, from a practical and biblical aspect. And uh, I'm going to turn it back over to Leon and Arsenio. Uh, if you have any questions, please let me know. Shoot me and we'll, we'll get that all figured out. Amen. Thank you, brother. Wow. So much there. Amen. Praise God. Brother, you are on fire. I love it. Hello, everybody tuning in and welcome from all across the world. Um, whoa. Listen. There is so much that we want to go on. Brother Dan, take a break, drink some water because we will come back to you. We have two questions. There is two questions out there. And you know what? This is so much fire. We're getting a lot of feedback right now. 
uh, pertaining to these questions. So, hey, I'm going to go ahead and throw this out there right now. This is from Ashley in San Diego. She says, in Leviticus chapter 7, verse 23 to 27, where you talked about the blood and oxes, can you show me something in the New Testament that applies to us? Your word, sir. Right. So again, I would point you back to where we just were in 1 Corinthians 10, and then also in 1 Corinthians chapter 8. This really kind of breaks it down for the New Testament Christian, the believer, and what we can and cannot eat. Again, 1 Corinthians chapter 8 and 1 Corinthians chapter 10, those are going to be your two major verses in the New Testament with how we're supposed to respond to what we're supposed to eat, how we're supposed to eat it, and can we eat these things? We're Gentiles unless we're Jews, and we're not necessarily under that Old Testament Levitical law. Although, again, like I mentioned in the beginning, that Levitical law was set as a guideline, and we can utilize that continuing forward on. We don't have to, uh, we're, we're, not, we're not sinning if we are you know, eating, eating a swine or a pig. Uh, but there could be another consequence down the line. And just when I view what's been going on in life and the way that people eat, I see people eat clams all the time, uh, clams and shrimp and shellfish, different things like that. And I it can't, I can't tell you how many times I see people get sick off of that stuff. Um, and so that, that's, that's my best answer to you is to just go to first Corinthians chapter eight and chapter 10 and Read it and then pray to the Lord and ask him what he would have you to do. That's definitely the most important thing. Amen. Ashley and San Diego, for your question, we are going to send you a book, a handbook. It's very easy. It fits in your pocket or a purse. And so this is Handbook for Disciple of Jesus. Uh, right now, there is this book is amazing. Um, I enjoy it. You know, if you have time during break time, lunch time, uh, I encourage you to read it. We will send this. Um, I'll have our administrators go ahead and send it out to you. Thank you for your question. Uh, the Handbook for Discipleship is basically a uh, it's a book for like minded believers, those who are following Christ. They want a little bit more with a uh, apical, you know. It's back with scripture, but we want more. We want a little bit more explanation. Yes, God's word is true, pure to the bone, bam, that's it. That's it. But we need still need discipleship. We need mentorship. Even Jesus had friends. You know, Jesus was teaching, discipling, mentoring. So anyway, great, great question. Ashley in San Diego, we are sending you some love. Uh, last question, and we have only one minute, but I hope uh, Dan will be fast on this one. Thomas from Denmark. Denmark, Europe. Daniel, what was one addiction you had and how did you overcome this? Well, growing up all my life, uh, we we didn't understand nutrition and I think it was eating candy all the time. And before I went in the Marine Corps, uh, I had a terrible addiction to, to candy and, you know, Snickers and M&Ms and Starbursts and Reese's and all that stuff. Um, and kind of just going into the Marine Corps, really just making a focus on eating right, eating healthy. And, you know, they put you through all those courses and it's kind of mandatory. Uh, and you notice then as you get older, uh, how your body shifts depending on what you eat and put in it. Uh, I didn't want to have that um, in me anymore. And uh, it just kind of fell off by the wayside. And then especially it's, it's expensive to eat that type of food these days, but watch a video called uh, uh, what, what is sugar made of? I think it's what it's called. And it's on YouTube. And it's, it's not, it's not what you think it is. There's a lot of different types of sugar out there. There's fructose, sucrose, uh, glucose, lactose, maltose, all different types of sugar. And the, it might say sugar on the label, but it's not always the exact same thing. So I, I hope that helps answer your question. Praise God. Thomas, we also will be sending you this book. Uh, we'll have our administrators reach out to you, and we know that it will bless you. Well, that is our time, folks. Thank you all for tuning in from every part of the world. If you know someone who's actively following Christ and they need a little bit more, or maybe you find them falling asleep in church, get them connected, get them plugged in for somebody that you know who's on fire for God. We have about 40 seconds. Dan, last thoughts, last comments, sir. I'm sorry, I hey, have a question. Oh, sorry, go, go ahead. ahead. Oh, no, go ahead. Oh, welcome, welcome, go ahead. 
I'm sorry, I just you mentioned about like uh, angel food. Can you explain a little bit more? Ancient food? Uh, angel, angel's food, I said. Ah, yes, angel's food. Yes, that one verse in, in Psalms. That's really the only, only place that I see it mentioned. Um, but it was as if it had came down from heaven. And so we know that it was just miraculously appearing there every single day, day and night. They had the bread in the morning or the manna, and then they had the meat at night uh, for dinner, and God had supplied it to them. And they were able to be sustained for 40 years. God did that for them, even though he didn't have to do that for them. Uh, and a lot of times they complained and grumbled and moaned, um, but, but God sustained them with that, quote unquote, angel's food. It's just the way that David explained it is that it was a, it's just a, it's just really just a wordplay for, for miracle, you know. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. Uh, to, to the listener, we will be contacting you. You also will be getting a handbook for discipleship. And so anyway, thank you for your question. That's our time for today, folks. Thank you all. If there's any other questions, we will leave a link below you with our information. You can contact us anytime. Somebody will be contacting you. Well, Daniel, once again, we thank you. And I'm going to go ahead and end on a prayer, if I may. Father God, in Jesus' name, I thank you, Lord God. We thank you, Lord, in the name of Jesus for this time. We thank you in agreement, Lord God. Thank you for your holy word. And we pray now before you, we are in agreement, Lord God, for you said, where there are two or more gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst of them. And we thank you, Lord God. I pray that this goes on to bless the billions of people around the world. We pray that this goes on to bless the billions of people around the world. Those who need to hear your words, Lord God, thank you for using us. Thank you for speaking to us, Lord. Thank you. You are perfect. You are always righteous. And no man cometh before you, Lord God, except through your son, Jesus Christ. We thank you, Lord God, honor and praise you for now and forevermore. In Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. Amen and amen. I love you all. Amen. Daniel, my sister in Christ, we will talk to you later. Bye-bye.